It is now seven minutes past 7 p.m. South African time, and I will officially begin the, the event. Um, welcome to this International Holocaust Remembrance Day event hosted by the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation in partnership with the United Nations Information Center and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. In 2005, the United Nations um, General Assembly designated January 27, which actually also is the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. On this annual day of commemoration, we urge you to honor the 6 million Jewish victims of the Holocaust and millions of other victims of Nazism. And through today's remembrance event, we hope that we will encourage you to engage in work and ways of thinking that will help us prevent future acts of hate, discrimination, othering, and genocides. Thank you to His Excellency Andreas Pischka, Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany, for his address tonight via video. Um, we are honored uh, for this address. Thank you. And also thank you to His Excellency Eli Bilotev Bilotekovsky, who is the ambassador of the state of Israel for gracing us with his presence live tonight, as well as uh, the address that we will hear from him tonight. We'll also be honored today to hear a message from the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres via video, and also an address by director of the United Nations Information Center in Pretoria, Mr. Masimba Dafirenika. And at this time, I would like us to, I would like to invite us to view and listen to a message from the secretary, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, via video. So if you could play that video, please, thank you. Holocaust, and also the Roma and Sinti and the countless other victims of its unprecedented horror and calculated cruelty. The Holocaust defined the United Nations. Our very name was coined to describe the alliance fighting the Nazi regime and its allies. Our charter was drafted in San Francisco as the Dachau concentration camp was liberated. The United Nations must always be on the front line of the fight against anti-Semitism and all other forms of religious bigotry and racism. Today, we witness an alarming resurgence of xenophobia and hate. Antisemitism, the oldest and most persistent form of prejudice, is rising yet again. Attempts to downplay or downright deny the Holocaust are proliferating. No society is immune to irrationality or intolerance. We must never forget that the Holocaust could have been prevented. The desperate pleas of the victims fell on deaf ears. Too few spoke out, too few listened. Fewer still stood up in solidarity. Remembering the past is crucial to safeguarding the future. Silence in the face of hatred is complicity. Today, let us commit to never be indifferent to the suffering of others and never forget what happened or let it be forgotten by others. Let us pledge to always be vigilant and uphold human rights and dignity for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Secretary General. It is now my privilege to invite the Director of the United Nations Information Center in Pretoria, Mr. Masimba Dafi Reniga, to, uh, to address us. Thank you very much, uh, Ndu, uh, the Program Director, survivors of the Holocaust, and their families who are with us today. Honorable members of the Diplomatic Corps, my friend Tali, the chair of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation, and also the director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Dr. Astrid Lay, the deputy head, the head scientist, and the exhibition curator at the Sachsenhausen Memorial Museum. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed uh, an honor and a privilege to be invited to join you today as we mark this year's International Day of Commemoration 
in memory of the victims of the Holocaust. Today, a day like today gives us an opportunity to pause and reflect on the significance of the Holocaust and what it means to present and future generations. It is an occasion to ask ourselves some hard and tough questions. Do we still hold dear our commitment to learn from and not to repeat the history of the Holocaust so that the declaration of the Genocide Convention never again does not ring hollow just as is just words on a piece of paper. Uh, our beliefs and values in private and public life, a true reflection of our dreams for a world that respects all forms of human rights is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Are we teaching our children in theory and in practice at school and at home the values of human dignity for all. If we answer these questions, yes, then today's commemoration is serving, as will future commemorations, the very purposes they were meant to fulfill. But alas, what we witness around the world today is not a true and positive reflection that that we have learned some practical lessons from the Holocaust. The Holocaust reminds, remains one of the ugliest stains in contemporary human history. It's clearly acknowledged by the UN Secretary General in the video that we have just watched and I cut. Today, we witness an alarming resurgence of xenophobia and hate, end of quote. Colleagues and friends, we cannot afford the luxury of keeping silent in the face of antisemitism, xenophobia, racism, and all other forms of discrimination. What we are witnessing today is a testimony that you and me still have many rivers to cross if we are to honor the lives of those who perished during the Holocaust not to mention other genocides that we have witnessed during our living times, including most recently the Rwanda genocide. Let us make a day such as today and all other days going forward serve as a constant and powerful reminder of the value of human lives. Let us not forget that love and peace do not just happen on their own we have to demonstrate love and to fight for peace. Ours is a work in progress that requires dedication and commitment. There is encouraging news, colleagues and friends. That encouraging news is that all of this is doable if we consistently and vigilantly guard against hatred in all its forms. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Dafirenika, for your address. Thank you very much. Um, it is now my privilege to invite Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany, His Excellency Andreas Peschka, to address us via a pre recorded video. So I would like us to please view that video. Thank you. Dear Talinates, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Today we commemorate the liberation of the Nazi German extermination camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau 78 years ago. Today, like then, we are shocked by the barbaric crimes committed there. And as a German, I feel shame at these acts of horror committed by my ancestors. The memory of Auschwitz must be kept alive. The memory of the Holocaust must be kept alive. The memory of the crimes that were committed must be kept alive. Auschwitz. The name stands for the millions of European Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust. 
Auschwitz stands for the genocide of the Sinti and Roma, for the murder of political prisoners, homosexuals, people with disabilities, and countless other people from all over Europe. The suffering of the people in Auschwitz, their death in the gas chambers, what happened there is beyond comprehension. At least 1.1 million people, the majority of them Jews, were systematically and ruthlessly murdered in Auschwitz-Birkenau. All of these people had a name and they had a history. How they were do deported here, crowded into cattle wagons, how they were selected on the ramp, all this was designed to dehumanize them and to rob them of their dignity. Remembering the crimes, naming the perpetrators, and commemorating the victims is an unending responsibility. Being aware of this responsibility has become an integral part of our national identity in Germany and it defines who we are as a democracy and a state based on the rule of law. Today we see Jewish life flourishing again in Germany. We enjoy a wide-ranging partnership with Israel. Only recently we jointly worked on an important resolution against the denial of the Holocaust at the United Nations in New York. This relationship is by no means something we can take for granted. It is a precious gift. It's even something of a miracle. Our basic law in the Federal Republic of Germany entered into force over seven decades ago. We are committed to human dignity, freedom, democracy and the rule of law. These are fundamental values and we have to defend them in our day-to-day -day life, in government activity and in political discourse. Unfortunately, it is necessary to say this so clearly because we are experiencing a worrying rise of racism an increasing intolerance and a wave of hate crimes in Germany but also in other countries. We see attacks on the fundamental values of democracy and freedom, a rise of anti-Semitic incidences, threatening Jewish life in our country and beyond. And so we need to say this very clearly. We must not tolerate anti-Semitism. Auschwitz serves as a warning and makes it a duty for all of us to be vigilant every day. As Primo Levi, who survived Auschwitz, once wrote, it happened, therefore it can happen again. We cannot close our eyes when people are being abused or humiliated. We must confront those who incite hatred against people of other faith and origins. All of this, all of us have this responsibility. A responsibility that includes remembrance. We must not forget. No line can be drawn under this past. Never again. This is the lesson of today. This is the lesson of Auschwitz. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Peschka, for that address. Thank you. It is now my privilege to invite Ambassador of the State of Israel, His Excellency Eli Belotekovsky, to please grace us with his address. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is a great honor for me to address you as an Israeli ambassador to the Republic of South Africa. Unfortunately, we couldn't meet and have this, have a real event due to COVID regulations. And we hope that next year, perhaps we can have a real event. Today, 27th of January, we mark the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The day on which in 1945, the Red Army had liberated the most terrible place ever built by human beings. Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. The word Holocaust 
brings different connotations, different associations to different people. For me, Holocaust is an enormous question mark on the essence of humanity. From the dawn of human race, people were continuously refined by ideals, values, cultures, or in one word, by civilization. And yet, in the middle of the 20th century, one of the most civilized nations in the world, a nation that produced cultural giants like Beethoven and Goethe, Kant and Lessing, Nietzsche and Schiller. And yet, this nation embraced a dark, primitive and extreme ideology, propagating racism and murderous hatred. Massive systematic extermination of the Jews and many other nationalities was only part of the plan. The Nazis tried not only to eliminate the Jewish people as a nation, they went further. They tried to erase their crime and erase the memory of their victims, erase any trace of their existence. How could these supposedly civilized people fall prey to these ideas, contradicting their values, their beliefs? We will never get an answer for this question. I think no rational mind can deal with such a subject. In 1942, Jan Karski, a Polish resistance fighter, brought the evidence of the concentration camp to Western Europe and the US. Based on the micro microfilm that Karski's, Karski smuggled, the Allies received the earliest and the most accurate account of the Holocaust in Poland. Karski met with President Roosevelt with British Foreign Secretary Eden, but not a single attempt was made by the Allies to stop the giant death factories, to bomb the camps or even the railway tracks. As Karski stated, I wanted to save millions and I was not able to save even one person. It's very difficult to believe that someone could envision a monstrosity of such magnitude. And yet, I think it's not only the question of the systematic and massive extermination, but it's also a question of a, a much more uh, wider significance. How could the free world stand aside and not even try to prevent the extermination of the Jews. The question of why the Allies did not act is in the words of Michael Birnbaum, the prominent Holocaust scholar, is a moral question emblematic of the allied response to the plight of the Jews during the Holocaust. On 7th of July, 1944, American bombers flew along and across the five deportation railway lines on their way to bomb oil refineries. Industrial complex adjacent to Auschwitz was bombed four times, but the concentration camp, nor the railway tracks, not even once. The attitude of the, of the allies raise, raises questions that are relevant also today. 27,712 people received from Yad Vashem, the Israel Holocaust Memorial, the titles of righteous among the nations. Many thousands are yet to be acknowledged. These were individuals who risked their lives and in many cases, lives of their families to save Jews and to save humanity. They saw it as their moral duty and did not hesitate to do their courageous acts. These were individuals, but the governments, where were the governments? How come the allies let the extermination go on and on and on? Today, we are 77 years after these tragic events. And today, the Jews of the world have a Jewish state, Israel, where they can always find a heaven from persecution. 
but also Israel faces threats of extermination and destruction. Can we count on anybody's help? Unfortunately not. In my opinion, if there is something we can learn from the Holocaust, it's that the free world is very good on expression sympathies, but less, much less on action. The lesson is that we can count only on ourselves. It's sad, but it's realistic. I would like to thank the staff of the Holocaust Museum in Johannesburg for organizing this event. In particular, I want to commend Tali Nadis, who is the spirit behind the museum and behind the story of the Holocaust in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, His Excellency Belotekovsky. Thank you very much for, for that address. Thank you. Um, it is now again my privilege to invite Director Tali Nates, who is the chair of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation and executive director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center to address us. Thereafter, we will also hear powerful messages from Holocaust survivors via video. Um, director Nates, over to you. Thank you very much, Mdu. Um, it is an honor to welcome our dear Holocaust survivors that are joining us today, and also our dear Rwandan survivors who are joining us today. Ambassadors of Israel and Germany, ambassadors and members of the diplomatic corps, director of UNIC Pretoria, directors, board members, and team members of the three Holocaust and Genocide Centers in South Africa, partners and friends from around the world. As chair of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation, the association of the three centers in South Africa, in Cape Town, Durban, and Johannesburg, it is an honor to partner again with UNIC and with Rosa Luxemburg Foundation to commemorate the International Day in memory of the victims of the Holocaust and also the liberation of Auschwitz. I would like to extend a special thanks to you, ambassadors of Germany and ambassador of Israel for your very important and powerful message and for your support. I also thank Dr. Estrid Ley, a friend for many, many years uh, and the deputy director of the Sachsenhausen Memorial and Museum, and also curator of the exhibition in the country of numbers where the men had no name for addressing us soon and officially also open the exhibition in South Africa. The 27th of January, 1945 was the day that the Auschwitz complex of camps was liberated. And as such, it was chosen as the day when the world remembers the horrors of the Holocaust or the Shoah. This year's commemoration is the 77th one. And uh, uh, that is when we go back to 1945 and the liberation of Auschwitz. And why Auschwitz? Because after the war, Auschwitz became, in a way, the symbol of the Holocaust. Even though there were 42,000 different concentration camps throughout Europe and Africa, the name of Auschwitz stays with us and is known to us. So what is Auschwitz? Auschwitz, Auschwitz was not one camp, but a complex comprising more than 40 subcamps and three main camps, Auschwitz I, Auschwitz II Birkenau, and Auschwitz III Buna Monowitz. By the spring of 1943, the Nazis built four guest chambers in, in crematoria in Auschwitz Birkenau. And many of us know this, but let me repeat, because we need to remember that trains from all over Europe 
arrived in Birkenau and SS doctors selected left or right, only a small number of deportees for forced labor, maybe 15% of each transport, and the rest were chosen for immediate death. Those chosen for life were clothed in prisoners' uniforms, their hair was shaved, and only in Auschwitz they received tattooed numbers on their arms. All the others, mostly women, children, and the elderly, were ordered to undress and surrender their personal belongings. They were then herded into the guest chambers when, where the Nazis murdered them with Cyclone B gas. The Zonderkommando, the Jewish prisoners, who were forced to work in the gas chambers and crematoria, removed the bodies, extracted gold teeth, and shaved the woman's hair before burning the corpses. They too would be murdered about three months later. The Nazis murdered more than 1.1 million Jews in that way. They murdered 75,000 Polish prisoners. 21,000 Roma and Sinti, 15,000 Soviet prisoners of war, and 10,000 prisoners of other nationalities, all in Auschwitz. The SS began evacuating the Auschwitz camps on the 18th of January, 1945. Thousands had been killed in the camps in the days before that, evacuation in those notorious death marches into Germany. SS units forced nearly 60,000 prisoners to march and only less than 8,000 remained behind in Auschwitz, among them Otto Frank, the father of Margot and Anne Frank, and the only survivor of that family. The Soviet 60th Army, part of the first Ukrainian front, and let's remember that, liberated the camp complex on the 27th of January. This year's commemorations are held all around the world, from Kigali, Rwanda, to the Car Senegal, from UN headquarters in New York to Tokyo, Japan. For the first time, commemoration is held in Egypt. A commemoration article appeared today in a Pakistani newspaper. Wherever these commemorations are held, in one voice, we all remember the past and demand that we learn some lessons from it, not always successfully, may I say. This morning, our team at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, as we do annually together with Education Africa and the United Nations Information Center, Pretoria, taught 60 grade nine learners from Masibambane College in Orange Farm about the Holocaust, and the learners listened to the testimony of Holocaust survivor Irene Klaas, also toured the permanent exhibition at the center. It was a very memorable event. In these difficult times with the rise yet again of anti-Semitism, as well as the assault on democracy, the rising of hate speech, xenophobia, and general violence against the other, wherever and whatever that other is, we know that lessons need to be learned even more urgently than before. Today is a day that serves as a reminder of the need for wiser choices by all of us, individuals and governments. 
It is a day of reflection and education. And more than anything, it is a day of memory of the victims of the Holocaust, men, women, and children who were targeted, not because of something they have done, but just for being born Jewish or Roma or any of the other targeted groups that the Nazis targeted. Today, I remember my grandmother, Eleonora or Lea, and my young aunts, Hella and Silla Turner, who were murdered in August of 1942 in the Belgians Killing Center. We all should remember the victims of the Holocaust. Today, we also honor and cherish our survivors who continue to share their painful testimonies with all of us, hoping that we learn from their experiences and that such acts will not be repeated. As we remember the 6 million Jews, the Roma and Sinti, the people with disabilities, the homosexuals and other who were targeted by the Nazis, that were murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators, I would like us to watch a testimony from three survivors that settled in South Africa. And I'll invite you to reflect while we watch those testimonies and stories. Thank you very much. The young girl in this 1938 poster is Doris Ehrenstein, now Lurie, who was born in Vienna, Austria, in February 1928. When Doris was in primary school, an ad man selected her to be the Barter Girl. And the same year Doris posed for this image, the Anschluss, or the takeover of Austria by Germany, occurred. As a Jew, Doris was no longer allowed at school, and with their lives at risk, she and her mother had to flee Vienna immediately. Doris escaped first to France and then to Great Britain. In 1940, Doris and her mother had to leave again, and this time moved to South Africa, where she completed her schooling, a degree in science, married, and had three children and a successful career. Israel Izzy Gerwitz was born in Vilna, then Poland, in 1932. In 1941, after the Nazi occupation, his family was forced into the Vilna ghetto. Izzy's older brother, Alan, managed to escape and hid with Tonya Pitrick, the family's pre-war Polish governess. Izzy and his father were sent to a labor camp. His mother and little sister were murdered in the Ponari forest. A few weeks later, Izzy was loaded into a cattle truck and through the tiny windows he recognized they were headed in the direction of the Ponari forest. When the train approached a dark tunnel, he jumped out from the window. Izzy was trapped for hours in the tunnel between German guards until a Polish rail repairman saved him by smearing his face with dirt and leading him out pretending he was an assistant. Izzy made his way to Tonya's house and when she opened the door he was amazed to see his brother Alan there. They were hidden in a small secret cupboard until their liberation by the Red Army. After the war they moved to South Africa. Antonina, Tonya Pitrick, and her nephew Vitas Kosakas were later recognized as righteous among the nations. This beloved childhood toy belonged to Holocaust survivor Veronica Phillips, who received the doll in 1936 when she was 10 years old. She would take this doll everywhere until she was forced to leave it behind when the Nazis and their Hungarian collaborators deported her to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Her father, Mayor Katz, 
who was also deported, was murdered. Remarkably, Veronica survived Ravensbrück, Pennock, and Johann Georgenstadt concentration camps, as well as a death march. Veronica's mother, Regina, and brother Michael survived the Holocaust in the international ghetto in Budapest, Hungary, and after the war, Veronica was reunited with them and the doll. Her mother had kept it safe for her in the ghetto. Veronica was an avid supporter of the JHGC and played a vital role in Holocaust education up until her death in February 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Director Nates, for your address. And thank you for sharing those very moving, incredible stories of those survivors. Thank you very much. It is now again my privilege to invite Dr. Astrid Ley. Dr. Ley is the Deputy Head of Sachsenhausen Memorial and Museum and is working as Head Scientist and Exhibition Curator at the Sachsenhausen Concentration Camp Memorial. Um, Dr. Lay, it is my pleasure to invite you to address us. Thank you very much. Would you put the, the first slide, please, Lou? Yes. Thank Let you. Me... Yeah. Can you um, see it? I can see it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the chance uh, to, to speak to you tonight and to, to present uh, my exhibition in the country of numbers. Uh, at the Johannesburg Center. Um, in my short speech and in the exhibition, um, I would like to introduce a group of Nazi persecutes to you. Um, and the exhibition is titled In the Country of Numbers, Where the Men Have No Names. And the group it is about are the Jewish men who were deported to Sachsenhausen concentration camp after the November pogrom of 1938, the so-called Crystal Night, and after a few weeks who we were released from Sachsenhausen concentration camp and went to exile. The exhibition took its name from an unpublished memoir I discovered in the Wiener Library in London some years ago. The author of this memoir, uh, Gerhard Nassau, a young Hakshara student from Berlin, wrote about his concentration camp imprisonment following the Crystal Night soon after his release when being in South American exile. In his memoir, Nassau addressed the Sachsenhausen camp consistently as the country of numbers where the time stands still and the men have no names. Next slide, please. With this phrase, uh, Gerhard Nassau was aiming at the prisoners' numbers. During admission in the camp, every man received a number that replaced his name. The stripes with the numbers had to be sewn onto the prisoners' clothing. You can see it in the picture. By this, together with the uniformed striped suits and the shaved heads, the SS sought to completely de-individualize their victims. The men robbed of their individuality and reduced to a number became part of an anonymous mass. So it was done. One of the Sachsenhausen November program inmates later wrote, I was no longer a human being. I didn't have a name anymore. I was prisoner number X, Y, Z. It was this transformation that many Jewish men later saw as the worst experience of their imprisonment, despite all the humiliation, mistreatment, and pain they had to go through at Sachsenhausen. Next slide, please. Siegfried de Beer. You see him in the photo, a businessman from Oldenburg even smuggled his prisoner number out of the camp in his shoe when being released from Sachsenhausen after six terrible weeks. By doing so, he took a great personal risk. Had he been caught, he would most probably not have survived. 
But by doing so, he also took possession of an object with which, like no other item, stood for the injustice inflicted on him at Sachsenhausen. The stripe with the, the bear's number 10259, you see it in the picture, therefore, seemed the ideal icon for the exhibition. It was a big honor when the de Beer family, who pre had preserved the fabric with a number in Argentina ever since Siegfried went there in 1939, when the family donated this original piece to the memorial during the first opening of the exhibition in Berlin in November 2018 at the 80th anniversary of the Crystal Night. It is only logical that Nassau, the guy uh, whose um, memoir I started with, that Gerhard Nassau understood his release from the camp as the moment of his rehumanization. Already from mid November 1938 on, about a week after the November pogrom, every day a certain number of men imprisoned after the pogrom were released. Once Nassau's number had been called out during the announcements of releases. So Nassau, together with more than 200 fellow inmates, um, was to be released. He had to wait for several hours, but then was allowed to hand in his prisoner uniform and get his own clothing and other belongings back. I citate, citate from his uh, memoir, we got our purses and valuables back and had to sign for it with our names. We were no longer numbers. Next slide, please. When speaking about the topic of the exhibition I was planning in the time of the preparation of the exhibition, I often received astonishment. I experienced astonishment, especially in Israel and the US. The fact that Jews could be released from concentration camps and were able to leave Germany in pre-war time is hardly known. But the mass arrests following the Crystal Night, when over 27,000 Jewish men throughout Germany were taken to concentration camps, these mass arrests were intended to escalate the pressure on German Jews to emigrate. With this goal in mind, the Gestapo had arrested mainly well-to-do and young and middle-aged Jewish men. 6, 000, more than 6,300 of them were brought to Sachsenhausen and at least 65 of them did not survive. They did not, they died in the camp. But nearly all the others though were released by the spring of 1939 on the condition that they would leave Germany immediately. Not all of them managed to do so. At least 1,800 men released from Sachsenhausen on the condition of emigration fell victim to the Holocaust in the end. Some weren't able to leave the country in part because it was increasingly difficult to get the necessary papers. These men were later deported to ghettos and extermination camps where they were murdered. Others who at first found refuge in France or the Netherlands were trapped when the Germans invaded in 1940 and they too were killed in the Holocaust. Still, the majority two thirds of the men deported to Sachsenhausen, managed to leave and consequently survived the period of Nazi rule and war. Today, their children and grandchildren come from all over the world to the Sachsenhausen Memorial to see the place where their relatives suffered. Next slide, please. It was through encounters with members of the second and third generation like Janine Hack from Cape Town, whose grandfather Heinz 
and grand, great grandfather Emil Galliner were imprisoned at Sachsenhausen, and it was not certain that sev sometimes several members of one family were brought to Sachsenhausen altogether. Um, it was through encounters with people like Janine Hack that the idea for this exhibition was conceived. How were the lives of these families who come to Sachsenhausen affected by the forced emigration of their parents and grandparents who usually were compelled to sell all their possessions for much less than the market value? What did they have to go through to get their immigration papers? What was waiting for them in the countries where they took refuge, countries whose languages most of them did not understand? Were they able to build lives for themselves in exile, they were, that which were at all comparable to those they had left behind in Germany? Did they find a new home? The exhibition uh, that you can see in the uh, Johannesburg uh, Center looks at these questions from the perspective of the second and third generation, the children and grandchildren of the imprisoned men who were willing to speak on camera. 13 different family biographies, 13 stories, life stories from exile, from different places of refuge are presented in the exhibition. These family biographies are fortunate stories of survival. But it's important to keep in mind that they were also experiences of persecution. You do not understand the nature of exile. The famous German historian Wolfgang Benz once said, cite, citation, if you don't take it as a form of persecution with, 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 with effects also on the next generations. And this is something that we can hardly overemphasize in the light of today's refugee issues. The impact of the persecution on the children and grandchildren of the November pogrom prisoners who left Germany, the trauma of fleeing, is closely related to the fact that the immigration was life-saving. Many families, therefore, suffer from something that we call a guilt of survival. Next slide, please. Um, I want to give you an example. When descendants of Werner Schindler, whom you see in the photo here, who fled to the UK in 1939 after five weeks at Sachs in Sachsenhausen, when his descendants visited the memorial in 2017, they at first did not try to get in touch with us. They simply did not expect anybody, any, any staff member of the memorial being interested in a prisoner who survived the camp, given the many fatalities there. Families like the Schindlers, whom we present in the exhibition, had to leave their home country under dishonorable circumstances after being discriminated against, excluded, mistreated, imprisoned, deprived, insulted, humiliated, and deeply hurt. Next slide, please. Alexander de Beer, the son of uh, Walter de Beer, whom you see in the photo. Alexander de Beer still vividly remembers how bitterly disappointed his father was about the fact that he had been arrested by his own sports colleagues wearing SA uniforms. Citation, my father was completely surprised. He was a very dedicated athlete, many different kinds of sport. He was active, he received multiple awards. And for him, it was an absolutely shocking experience for his own former friends and teammates to arrest him and march him through the streets of Oldenburg. Photos of this march, uh, this infamous march, have uh, survived, and you see one uh, on this slide here. Um, next slide, please. Willy Levison, a merchant from Hamburg, whose biography is also on display, 
refused to even believe the injustice inflicted on him at first. Levison was released from Sachsenhausen after just two weeks of imprisonment because his wife could manage to obtain immigration papers for or immigration papers for South America on the quick. Yet it cost her huge efforts to keep her husband from going to work as usual on the day after his release. Um, Levison's son Mario remembers, citation, my father felt very safe. He always said, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm a German soldier, so what do they want from me? But he wasn't able to imagine that another German soldier would arrest him just because he was Jewish. Blind with tears, according to the family's recollections, the decorated World War I veteran Levison boarded a ship to Uruguay on the day following his release from the camp. Next slide, please. It was this moment, this moment of, of leaving, when some of the Jewish expellees decided to never return to Germany again. Ilse Blair, the wife of the Berlin-born composer Werner Bär, Ilse, she died at the age of 101 in 2019, and I had the privilege of meeting uh, in Melbourne in 2017. Ilse left Germany together with her husband, you see the young couple in the photo, in December 1938. She recounted the moment of their departure as follows. Citation, I can tell you something. I was the born Berlinerin when I was young. I left Berlin. It was wonderful with all the artists, with all, with all the streets, the big city. It was absolutely wonderful in every respect. I just loved it. And I will never forget before I left Berlin, it was on a train sort of high up. I looked over the city and I said to myself, I never want to see it again. I was overwhelmed by the openness and warmth and helpfulness with which the children and grandchildren of those expelled from Germany welcomed me with my project. Almost all the family biographies that are presented in the exhibition and that you can see in the Holocaust Center in Johannesburg, almost all these biographies are based on personal contacts that I was able to make with relatives at the memorial or during research trips. The members of the families that are in the exhibition have willingly, willingly searched old photo albums and long forgotten boxes of pictures and documents. And I'm well aware that for some of them, this has been a fairly painful process. The families generously helped in so many ways. They patiently answered many questions over and over again. They included other sometimes quite distant relatives. They provided additional contacts and they patiently endured my urging because there was quite some time pressure. Um, some spoke on camera about the impact of the events of 1938 on their own lives, as well as about their memories of their parents and grandparents, experiences of violence, deportation, flight, and exile. They welcomed me in their homes during my research trips to the US and Australia, and they showed not only great interest, but also gratitude for my work. And um, yeah, it, this is, I don't have, in the end, uh, this was, this appreciation for the project was what uh, really touched me deeply and was a really great honor for me. And I would like to close uh, with something um, Frank Walter Steinmeier, the German president, yesterday visited Sachsenhausen uh, Memorial, and he said something that I would like to share uh, to, with you to, to finish here. He said, there is no right to forget. 
but there's a right to remembrance. And it's the right of the survivors and of their families, their children and grandchildren, uh, that we remember what the Germans did during National Socialism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Lei. As Dr. Lei mentioned, the, the exhibition is currently housed at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center until the 31st of March this year. And then thereafter, later in the year, it will go to Durban, to the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center, and also to the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center. So if you are in, in Johannesburg currently, please um, visit the center and view the exhibition uh, in our resource center, in our second floor um, uh, space. And at this time, I would like to invite all of us to view the exhibition via a pre-recorded video. So please, uh, may we play that video. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was a very, very short video, uh, but it just gives you a taste of what the exhibition looks like. And when you do uh, um, visit the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, uh, there's a lot more to experience. And then if you are in Cape Town or if you are in Durban, when the exhibition arrives in, in those cities, please also take the time to view it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it has now come to the end of our event. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, thank you to our partners who uh, partnered to create this event, the, the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation, the Rosa Luxemburg, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, and the United Nations Information Center in Pretoria. Thank you very much to our excellencies, His Excellency Andreas Peschka, Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany for his address. And also thank you to His Excellency, Ambassador Eli Belotekovsky, Ambassador of the State of Israel for his presence throughout um, the event, he, he remained present. Thank you very much for that. And thank you very much to the director of the United Nations Information Center in Pretoria, Mr. Masimba Dafirenyika. Thank you very much for your address and for your, your presence as well. Thank you to Director Tali Nates for gracing us with your presence and your address. Thank you to also Mary Kluck, who's the director of the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center for gracing us with your presence. And also Heather, Director Heather Blue Menthol, who's the director of the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you to Holocaust survivors who are part of this event in spirit and in person. Thank you very much. I hope that next year, perhaps, we will be able to meet in person and in better circumstances. So until then, please be safe and please remember what this day means and practice that meaning in your lives and make those connections. Thank you very much. Good night. And if you are elsewhere, good morning or good evening, whatever time of the day it is. Thank you very much. <laughs>